Hello, everybody, uh, and uh, Yoma, welcome to Canberra, which is, of course, Ngunnawal country, where we pay respects uh, and acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land and their elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as the indigenous peoples of wherever you might be. My name is Bryce Wakefield, and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And tonight we're going to be talking about, um, among other things, nationalism. Um, and one of the uh, great scholars of nationalism, Benedict, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, said that um, it's, it's, it's well known to all scholars that the nation state uh, is a modern construction, uh, but it's not so well known to nationalists. Um, how we view the nation state, and how we view our own nation states, of course, uh, frames and determines how we think about the state's place in the world and how we think about relations between states. Now, one uh, person who has uh, thought about this deeply in the context of China is Bill Hayton, who joins me here this evening or this morning where he is. Hello, Bill. Hi there, <laughs> 7 a.m. here, <yeah>. morning. <laughs> Okay, Bill is the author of uh, this not so little red book, The Invention of China. Um, it's going to be the subject of uh, much of what we're discussing uh, today, but he's also the author of um, another fantastic book that I read on the weekend, and my, it's a, it's a real masterpiece, The South China Sea. Um, I'd recommend uh, either of those books to anyone. And I'd probably also recommend this one too, uh, which uh, is his first book on Vietnam, which was updated for a 2020 edition. Uh, I'd recommend it because the other two books were such a thrill to read. So I'm sure this one will be too, I've only just started. Now, Bill um, is a former, uh, just former BBC uh, journalist. He has spent time uh, among other places in Vietnam and Myanmar. But he's now an associate fellow with the Asia Pacific program at Ch Chatham House in London. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Bill for a presentation, and then we'll come back to you for the Q and A. Of course, as uh, as is de rigueur for these things, please write your uh, questions in the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'll uh, do my best to answer them, or do my best to read them out. Sorry. Um, and I believe the upvote function is turned on. So if you see a question you like, hit the thumbs up sign and it will float to the top of the pack. So Bill, over to you. Great, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bryce. And uh, your 5% will be in the post. Um, thanks to the Institute uh, for making this happen and for everybody who has, uh, has tuned in. Uh, this is the only good thing about the pandemic, isn't it? The fact that uh, we can all be in touch with each other without having to, to fly thousands of miles. Um, so this um, book came out of my um, experience really on the South China Sea. Um, it's uh, in the course of writing that book that, uh, that Bryce just mentioned, I, I came to understand. So this, this is the current book, The Invention of China. Um, the old one, I looked into the history of the emergence of China's claims in the South China Sea. Um, and in the process of looking at it, I came to understand that what China was doing in the South China Sea was not so much um, uh, you know, advancing an existing claim, but creating a new one. And the more I looked at this, the more I realized that things, similar things were happening on land as well, thinking about where territory um, existed, what was Chinese, what wasn't, and then the whole question of national identity and, and so forth. So this talk I'm going to give today is based upon some of the ideas in, in chapter seven of the book, which is about territory. But I'm going to begin uh, in a uh, gap store on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls in May 2018, when a $7.99 t-shirt uh, caused uh, an international um, scandal, I suppose you might say. Uh, it was part of a series of t-shirts printed with place names on the front and the back. Most were illustrated with a flag of the relevant country, but the China version had a map. And a keen-eyed Chinese patriot noticed that the map on the China t-shirt failed to include the full extent of the country's territorial claims. As they demonstrated with the help of an annotated photo on the social media site Weibo, the gap map 
omitted the islands of the South China Sea, the areas in the Himalayas occupied by India, and most egregiously, of course, the island of Taiwan. Uh, the post was picked up by a popular blogger who forwarded it onto her thousands of followers with a message to Gap. If you earn Chinese money, why can't you be careful about China's territorial interests? And as that day wore on, book calls for a boycott of Gap stores began to spread and the government's army of online censors made no attempt to stop them. Many of the boycott supporters asserted that Gap must have deliberately chosen to humiliate China by choosing such a map. Perhaps it was because the t-shirt was printed in India or Taiwan, they suggested. The accusations mounted. Before the day was out, Gap China had loudly declared in its own Weibo statement that it respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of China, that the t-shirt failed to reflect the correct map of China and that the company sincerely apologized for this unintentional error. The t-shirts were then pulled from the shelves in China and online stores everywhere else. It's an increasingly common problem. In March 2019, Mac, the cosmetics brand owned by Estee Lauder, had to apologize after an email sent to customers in the United States failed to include Taiwan on a map of China. In January 2018, the Marriott hotel chain also had to apologize after listing Taiwan and Tibet as separate countries in a customer survey. And around the same time, several foreign airlines that listed Taiwan as a country were forced to amend their websites. It's becoming a problem for governments too, as diplomats pressure them to either recognize or not contradict China's territorial claims. The phrase, you have hurt the feelings of the Chinese people is becoming well known all around the world. This assertiveness about how China's boundaries are represented isn't limited to armchair activists either. In April, 2017, the China's parliament tightened up the country's surveying and mapping law obliging the government at all levels, but particularly news media and schools to carry out publicity and education to quote, raise the citizens awareness of national territory. In February, 2019, the Chinese government went even further with specific rules covering the printing within China of maps in books or magazines intended for sale outside China. Each map would require permission from provincial officials and none would be allowed to be distributed within the country. The possibility that a Chinese citizen might see a map showing an, an unauthorized version of China's territorial claims was perceived as such a threat to national security that the regulations were to be policed or are policed by the National Work Group for Combating Pornography and Illegal Publications. The following month, authorities in the port city of Qingdao destroyed 29,000 English, English language maps destined for export because they showed Taiwan as a separate country. Now, obviously, China is not the only country with concerns about its borders. What's striking, however, is the extent to which anxiety about those borders has become a national neurosis. Speeches by Xi Jinping make clear that his vision of national rejuvenation can only be complete when all the territory claimed by China is under Beijing's control. The official media constantly reminds citizens of the state's territorial claims exhort them to personally identify with those claims and nurture feelings of hurt and shame towards unresolved border disputes. Paranoia about national boundaries in China is not merely an obsession of online gamers or Weibo patriots, it's central to the state itself. Now the easy explanation, the lazy explanation for this is to attribute everything to the century of humiliation. The idea that everything is great in China before 1840 that everything was then terrible until the communist victory in the Civil War of 1949, and now everything is great again. There are many problems with this narrative, not least that at the time, the two so-called opium wars were treated as rather minor events. As Frank de Curta and Julia Lovell have shown, it was only in the 20th century that they took on totemic significance. Instead, I want to show you how anxiety about borders and the associated concept of national humiliation were deliberately inculcated in the minds of citizens of the Republic of China as part of its nation building strategy. This anxiety was then passed on to the People's Republic after the communist victory and endures to this day. If you're an expert on this period, you may recognize some of the elements of this talk. What I'm trying to do is bring some of the insights by people like Paul Cohen, Zheng Wang, James Leibold, William Callahan and others to a wider audience. So my book starts 
from the understanding that we need to look at the uh, political formations as they presented themselves at the time. And before February 1912, the political formation that ruled the piece of territory we're talking about today called itself the Qing Empire, so the Qing Great State, Da Qing Guo. Foreigners called it the Qing Empire. It was a state that had its origins with the Jurchen people northeast of the Great Wall, up here in this area, um, who took the name Manchu. Their state declared itself to be the Qing in 1936, conquered the Ming state down here in the, the flatlands, if you like, Ming state, sometimes called China proper, down here, and ruled a multi-ethnic domain until the revolution of 1911, 1912, expanding into Mongolia and then Tibet and Xinjiang and outer Mongolia. China proper, therefore, the 15 provinces of the former Ming state was a colony of an inner Asian empire. So what then was the nature of the Qing state that foreigners encountered when they arrived in the mid 19th century? Pamela Crossley has used the term simultaneous rule to describe the way the Qing used different techniques to rule different regions. It was a framework in which five constituencies, Manchu, Han, Mongol, Muslim and Tibetan, each defined by the writing scripts that they used and corresponding to a particular territory, could coexist within the great state while maintaining their own beliefs and systems of rule. The emperor could practice Buddhism and appear as a leader to Tibetans. He could appear as a Bele to the Manchu or a Khan to the Mongols or a Confucian ruler to the people that the Manchus called Han. The system was flexible enough for each group to feel autonomous and yet part of a whole. Manchu was a court language right up until 1912 the leadership insisted that traditional archery and other sources of identity were maintained. Manchus were limited to certain roles, particularly the military, not allowed to become farmers or merchants. They had a monopoly on the top posts of the state and they made up around half of all senior officials, although they were just 1% of the total population. Chinese cities were physically divided into Manchu and Han, and you can still see this in the uh, framework, in the layout of, of Beijing to this day, that's the Manchu city there, the inner city, and then the outer city, uh, Chinese city uh, down the south. These walls were not small things. This is the, uh, an, an old photograph of the, of the wall in, uh, in the 1900s. So this inter intermarriage between Manchu and Han was uh, banned until 1902. The process of Chinese nation building is really a story of how this Manchu led state was turned inside out. Chinese nationalists assumed the right to rule the entirety of what was, in territorial terms at least, a largely non-Chinese empire. They also assumed the right to decide who was Chinese, how their Chineseness should be expressed, how they should speak, and so on. As I show in the book, this process really begins in the 1880s and 1890s, but I want to start today with the reaction against the Western intervention that followed the Boxer Rising of 1900. Chinese radicals were appalled both by the failure of the Qing state to resist the foreigners, but also by the weakness of the people who surrendered. As this cartoon by the guy who was later to be a co-founder of the Communist Party, Chen Duxiu, shows. All of this was motivated by new ideas of social Darwinism, then circulating among intellectuals and the associated fear of racial extinction. Radicals contrasted the failure to remember the country's repeated defeats by foreigners with the example of King Gujian, king of the Yua people in the fifth century BC. Gujian had been defeated and experienced the shame of the ruling house or Guo Qi. He then hung a gallbladder over his dining table and you can see his, uh, his gallbladder up here, uh, not his gallbladder, obviously somebody else's gallbladder. He hung a gallbladder over his dining table so that he would endure the bitter taste of gall at every meal for the following 20 years until he eventually overcame his enemies. In 1904, a writer in the magazine Dongfang Zaji took the idea of Guo Qi, Guo Qi, of the shame of the ruling house, and repurposed it. It would go on to mean the shame of the nation, of everyone in the state. But he complained that Chinese people themselves were impervious to feelings of national shame. And this is a repeated refrain throughout the early nationalist period, that the Chinese people are not nationalist enough. They don't feel the shame and the humiliation that their country uh, has endured. 
So it becomes a task of the nationalists to constantly remind people that they have been humiliated and that therefore they have to join the nationalist movement and the revolution. So this sense of national humiliation was then propagated as a critique of the Qing Empire, periodically rising up during the 1900s to mobilize public opinion. There was a particular example in 1908 in connection with a scandal surrounding a Japanese ship, the Tatsu Maru, which was marked by a National Humiliation Commemoration Day. And the language of national humiliation becomes an important mobilizing tool for the revolutionaries. It helps to create a sense of identity against both foreigners and the ruling elite of the Qing state. It became so powerful that it became ubiquitous. In this illustration from Paul Cohen's book, we can see it used to sell cigarettes in an advertisement from 1925. Smoking Golden Dragon was portrayed as a patriotic act. Over here, men stand under trees decorated with banners reading Guo Qi, National Humiliation, watched by King Zhujian over here, still licking his gallbladder. Someone else's gallbladder. The second part of the story is the question of territory. At the time of the 1911-12 revolution, some radicals were prepared to cede the peripheral territories of the Qing great state in order to create a pure Han state in China proper. Others, including the revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen, were determined to ensure the Republic inherited all of the territory of the former empire. The quotes non-Chinese areas, Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, and Xinjiang, made up more than half of its territory and contained vital natural resources. But in order to express their desire to defend the national territory, Sun Yat-sen and people like Liang Qichao and their supporters had to create new words with which to describe it. There were several words for place in Chinese, but none that equated to territory with its connotations of ownership and sovereignty. The traditional term was Jiang Yu, which literally meant the boundary, the Jiang, of the imperial realm, the Yu. In dynastic times, the Yu stretched as far as the emperor's authority, and so in theory at least could have included tributary states and vassals. Its meaning was, however, vague and certainly didn't imply the existence of a fixed and defined border. A new word for territory comes into Chinese from Japanese, specifically from the, the Japanese translation of a text by the British social Darwinist, the, the founder of social Darwinism really, Herbert Spencer. In his 1883 translation of Spencer's political institutions, Sadashiro Hamano chose the two kanji characters, that's uh, the characters uh, which are shared between uh, uh, Japan and China and other East Asian states as Ryodo, literally governed land, to be the equivalent for territory. As the president of Keio University, Hamano was an authoritative figure and his translation soon spread into widespread use. Fifteen years later, the hugely prolific reformist writer Liang Qichao used the same characters in his newspaper. In classical Chinese, however, they are pronounced Ling Tu, but they have exactly the same meaning governed land. Lingtu therefore carries the clear meaning of a sovereign country enclosed within defined borders. From there, the word was picked up by one of Sun Yat-sen's followers, Hu Han Min, and used in a series of articles in the revolutionary's newspaper, Minbao, during 1904 and 1905. Hu Han Min was arguing that territorial sovereignty, Lingtu Juquan, was the foundation of international law and that logically the revolutionaries needed to oppose the unequal treaties demanded by foreign powers. In other words, the Chinese revolutionary movement's newfound passion for territory was the direct descendant of late 19th century European nationalisms. The progeny of this Euro-Asian ancestry emerged in the Republic of China's constitutional debates a decade later. The provisional constitution approved by Sun Yat-sen's government in March 1912, immediately after the revolution, set out in relatively precise detail what it believed the territory of the Republic should be. It said in effect that the new state inherited the, the boundaries of the Qin great state as they stood when the revolution broke out. Article three simply stated that the territory of the Chinese Republic consists of 22 provinces, inner and outer Mongolia and Tibet. The choice of 22 provinces was highly significant since Taiwan was the 23rd, 
and Taiwan had been ceded to Japan in the 1895 Treaty of Shimonoseki. But given that the constitutional text was still laying claim to Outer Mongolia, despite its declaration of independence there three months earlier, and to Tibet, despite the ongoing insurrection there at the time, and Xinjiang, despite its de facto independence at the time, this seems to be clear proof that the Republic of China had formally abandoned any claim to Taiwan. However, in May 1914, when Yuan Shikai, the general who'd forced Sun Yat-sen from office, imposed a new constitutional compact on the country, the definition of national territory was changed. Article three became the apparently tautological, the territory, using the word Lingtu, of the Chinese Republic remains the same as the domain or Jiangyu of the former empire. New words notwithstanding, the 1914 constitutional definition of the territory merely begged a further question about the exact extent of the domain of the former empire. After Yuan Shikai died in 1916, the compact was suspended and the first constitution was reinstated. But seven years later, the Republic returned to tautology. Eight years after that, the new provisional constitution promulgated by the Guomindang government of Chiang Kai-shek in 1931 struck a compromise. The last Republican constitution promulgated before the end of the Civil War, however, doesn't even attempt to define the national territory. This constitutional back and forth demonstrates that throughout this period and even beyond, there was considerable difficulty in deciding exactly where China's boundaries should be drawn. Some fundamental questions needed to be answered first. Chiefly, where were the boundaries of the Qing great state that the Republic had ostensibly inherited in 1912? The nationalist modernizers thought there was a simple answer to that question based on a view of borders they had acquired through contact with foreign powers and experts. The reality was far from simple. This question of territory had still not been resolved by the time Chiang Kai-shek's Guomindang took power across the whole country in 1927. It became a crucial tool for the Guomindang seeking to win the allegiance of a skeptical public. A small clique of professors and propagandists played a crucial role. Zhu Kejian was the first Chinese man to study geography at a Western university. Uh, Chang Chiyun was a student of his in, his in Zhu's first ever geography class when he returned home to teach in 1920. Zhang then joined the staff of the commercial press in Shanghai, where an editor was the brother of one of his classmates. The editor was Chen Bulai, who would also go on to play a major role in nationalist politics as propagandist to Chiang Kai-shek. Together, Zhu, Chen, Zhang and Chiang formed an influential clique at the intersection of academia, journalism and propaganda. They put geography, the academic discipline, at the service of the Guomindang's nationalist mission. In May 1928, just after the establishment of the Guomindang's national government in Nanjing, the party convened the first national conference on education. It resolved to adopt a new curriculum for schools based upon Sun Yat-sen's three principles of the people, nationalism, democracy and the people's livelihood. From 1929, all schools were expected to imbue their pupils with strong feelings of patriotism, mobilized in particular through the teaching of history and geography. Pupils were expected to study the various regions of the country, quote, in order to foster the national spirit. A major contribution to this patriotic education movement was a series of textbooks written by Zhang Qiyun. In 1928, the commercial press published one as Benguo Dili, Our Geography. Its key message was that China formed a natural unit despite its enormous size and variety. Yet the whole that Zhang portrayed in the textbook was a territory that in reality did not exist. The simple black line marking the national boundary encompassed huge areas that were not actually under the control of the government at the time, the independent states of Mongolia and Tibet in particular. Jiang portrayed them as natural parts of the Republic nonetheless. How reality would be reconciled with the map was not explained to the school pupils. Remarkably, given present day politics, there was a significant omission from Jiang's maps. Taiwan was not drawn on any of the national maps or, or not colored in in the textbook. Jiang and the other authors of the books were nationalists who sought to evince emotions of loyalty to a state and its territory in the hearts of their young audiences. They faced a problem that was deeply political. 
how could they persuade a child in a big coastal city, for example, to feel any connection with a sheep herder in Xinjiang? Why should they even have a connection? They found two main ways to do so. One group of authors simply stated that all Chinese citizens were the same. They were members of a single yellow race and a single nation, and no further explanation was needed. A second group, however, acknowledged that different groups did exist, but were nonetheless united by something greater. Within this group, some authors made use of yellow race ideas. Some used the idea of a shared, civilizing Hua culture while others stressed the naturalness of the country's physical boundaries. The most poetic technique was simply to compare the shape of the imagined country to that of a begonia or mulberry leaf turned on its side. The port of Tianjin up here becomes the petiole of the leaf with a central vein running west as a line of symmetry all the way to Kashgar in Xinjiang and beyond. The symmetry only made sense of course if outer Mongolia up here and Tibet are included and Taiwan is excluded. The historians Robert Culp and Peter Zarrow have documented many examples of other geography textbooks which use different, sometimes contradictory arguments and analogies to persuade students of the naturalness of the Republic's putative borders. An ever-present theme in these textbooks was the threat of foreigners eating away at the country's edges. It was reinforced through school lessons about territory lost during the previous century. Teachers could make use of a particularly Chinese form of nationalist cartography, the map of national humiliation. Dozens of such maps were published during the 1910s, 20s and 30s, sometimes within textbooks and atlases, and sometimes as posters for displays in classrooms and public buildings. They're typically portrayed, often in bright countries, land conceded, conceded and I put that in quotes, to countries to neighboring states over the previous century. And here are four examples from four different years. And you can see how the map makers have colored in these areas around the, the, uh, the edge um, in some you know, very imaginative ways, expending China's territorial losses right into Iran, to Afghanistan, uh, Siberia. And this map goes right the way down to include almost all of, all of Southeast Asia. Other uh, cartographers had different views of the land that had been stolen by, by foreigners. So this, these all four are, are examples of maps of national humiliation, and there are many, many others. There was a clear political purpose behind the making of these maps. They served to delegitimize the Qing dynasty by demonstrating its failure to defend the country and thereby legitimize the revolution. But they also deliberately, and I think this is, you know, this is the key point for today, they deliberately generate a sense of anxiety about the vulnerability of the nation's borders in order to promote loyalty to the new republic. They become markers of belonging, that in order to be a Chinese citizen, to be a true Chinese nationalist, you personally have to feel anxiety about the state of the nation's borders. And this is a theme which begins in the 1920s um, and is perpetuated today. It seemed to work with a young Mao Zedong he later told the American journalist Edgar Snow that hearing about national humiliation turned him into an activist. It wasn't just Mao, this was the birth of a national territorial neurosis. The geographers took the nationalist idea of territory, Ling Tu, and projected it back to the time of domain, Jiang Yu, when there were few fixed borders. The idea that, that at the time that they were lost, these territories might actually have been contested areas with no particular allegiance to any empire was not part of the lesson. They were presented simply as Chinese lands that had been stolen. The authors called on the young citizens reading the textbook to do what they could to try to recover all this lost territory. But did this mean that the lost territory should be included within the rightful boundary of the state or not? Was the shape of the country at that time natural or not? These questions weren't even posed in the textbooks, let alone answered. What was important for the authors was to encourage students to feel the sense of loss, the collective sense of national humiliation, and thereby develop a patriotic attachment to the country. In 1930, senior staff at the influential Shanghai-based newspaper Shunbao discussed organizing an expedition to the frontiers to celebrate the paper's 60th anniversary. 
they asked two well-known members of the National Geological Society of China, Ding Wenjiang and Wen Wenhao, and a cartographer to lead the effort. However, during the planning meeting, it became clear that no one knew where the actual frontier was. Ding told the gathering, if we want to organize a successful research trip of China's frontiers, first we need a map. The account of this story is actually written here in the preface of the, of the published um, atlas. No one has yet drawn a complete and accurate map of the entire country. Before we organize the trip, we should therefore work first on sketching a map of China. The anniversary plans therefore evolved into a project to publish a new natural national atlas. And the result was published in 1934. It was well produced and a bestseller. In the absence of any government produced equivalent, it became the national standard until well into the 1950s. However, its depiction of the frontiers was, in most places, a work of fiction. As was now standard in Chinese maps of the time, Tibet and outer Mongolia were depicted as integral parts of the state, which whilst they were actually more or less independent at the time, or literally independent, well, Taiwan was not. The neat black dashed and dotted line that ran around the Republic was more an expression of desire than reality. On the 28th of August, 1938, Chiang Kai-shek gave a speech to the first graduation ceremony for his Central Training Corps, a paramilitary organization intended to indoctrinate army officers and civil servants in the city of Hankou. He told his audience, if our people do not know the glory of our national history, how can they fully perceive our humiliation today? If they are not familiar with the geography of our nation, how can they find the resolve to restore our lost territory? From today forward, we must not tread this disastrous path any longer. We must absolutely give special emphasis to history and geography education to stimulate the citizens' patriotic spirit to defend the country and launch our people's brilliant and dazzling new destiny. That year, the curriculum of universities and then middle and high schools were revised to include more history and geography to, in the words of the education ministry, stimulate students' determination and resolve to rejuvenate our national people. So anxiety about territorial loss was a fundamental part of the nationalist education project right from the beginning. The Nanjing decade, 1927 to 37, saw deliberate efforts to combine the idea with na of national humiliation with the social Darwinist fear of racial extinction through geography and the presentation of lost territory. This is the origin of China's territorial hypersensitivity today. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks, Bill. The book, again, is uh, The Invention of China. The author is Bill Hayden. You've, um, you've heard um, a masterful presentation on the development of Chinese nationalism. Um, I, again, I can only recommend the book. I mean, as Bill said, it is a synthesis of, um, of other works that are out there, but it's one that is incredibly well written. And I used to teach nationalism um, as a lecturer at university. And gee, I wish I had this book to give to my students. It's a, it's, it's because a lot of texts on nationalism are quite turgid. This one is not. This is, this is wonderfully written. Um, but one of the points that you do make, um, and you make it fairly well. Well, what the book really does well is it does map the construction of the Chinese nation state. Um, no question about that. It's, it's fantastic um, in how it does that. But one of the points that you do make early on is that there's nothing actually special here about um, China as a modern nation state. If you believe Anderson and, um, and, and Hobsbawm and others, all states are, are modern entities. And um, you freely you know, give that away in the beginning. Um, the processes that you talk about are all very common. I think Anderson actually at one point said, um, if, you, you, if, you, you, if you can't feel shame, then you can't be a nationalist. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering what's different here because you do say that there is something very special about what you call China's sovereignty fundamentalism. And I'm wondering if you can, um, if you can, if you can let us know what that distinction is, what's different about the construction, or perhaps the modern maintenance of the uh, the Chinese nation state that allows for this sovereignty fundamentalism in your words. Um, 
Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so there's this kind of two things going on, I think, in your question. One is that the idea that uh, China is, you know, went through similar processes to, to, to other uh, nation states in, in their emergence. And then this question of, of sovereignty fundamentalism. So the, the first part I thought it was important to say, because I think a lot of people have a view of China, which is that it's somehow different, is that it's ancient and timeless and its history goes back, you know, 5,000 years, if you believe you know, Xi Jinping, uh, in a continuous history, and that that's completely different from any other country, um, that uh, nobody, no other country has the same. But of course, all countries have histories of 5,000 years or, or beyond, you know, because you know, as long as humans have been living there. Um, but uh, all of them, as they in this process of becoming a nation state, if defining themselves as modern and, and, and bounded with a line, um, have to go through a process whereby they say, well, where should this line rightfully be and who's in our country and, and who shouldn't be in our country? Um, uh, and European states went through this and uh, the Ottoman Empire went through this. Um, and all the kind of the round the sort of, you know, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Um, period. So I kind of wanted to sort of say that, you know, China went through this in exactly the same way and that many of these ideas about China as an ancient and unchanging civilization are themselves constructions, you know, that they were concocted by people like Liang Chichao and others um, in this sort of period, particularly the early 1900s. Um, but they became incredibly successful and that's because they chimed well with Western ideas about what China was and obviously they used uh, existing ideas within the country, within China, of what people thought their country was, or at least, you know, a certain group of people. Um, and so that's, the, that's why they got the power they did, that's why they animated the revolution. Um, China's sovereignty fundamentalism, I think, is this idea that um, uh, we see it sort of now in the idea that uh, sovereignty has some kind of, uh, I think, moral force. Uh, well, you know, Western states in the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and, and subsequently, they developed the idea of sovereignty as a kind of as a as a convenience that you know that uh, it would help to prevent war if states didn't interfere in one another's uh, internal issues, and it became a kind of a, a legal principle. But I think something about the way that sovereignty was transferred, the ideas of sovereignty, and this is another chapter in the book, were transferred into um, the Qing state in the Sort of middle to late 19th century, it was literally translated, you know, the word Juquan is coined, uh, it's an older word, but it, it gets given a new meaning to be the equivalent of sovereignty. Um, and it gets, it, you know, it gets adopted through translation. And I think in that process and in the context of the 19th century, something about Juquan uh, sovereignty is sort of given a moral force um, by, uh, by officials and, and thinkers. And so it sort of it somehow becomes a sort of mix of these Western legalist ideas and something older, I think, in China about you know, morality in, in public affairs. And it becomes a sort of um, you know, an idea that this is this is a kind of righteous way of behaving for its own sake. And the example I give in the book is um, uh, the uh, climate negotiations when uh, in the Copenhagen climate agreement, the whole basis of the agreement was that states would be able to monitor and, and comment on each other's um, uh, climate emissions, whereas, and China rejected that. Um, they accepted the Paris Climate Accord um, uh, six years later because it respects sovereignty. So this is an example where it's nothing to do with human rights or you know, media expression or political whatever. It's purely about the principle that states should be free to defend their own interests and that no one should interfere um, in their own affairs. So in the case of sovereign, in the case of climate change, uh, in theory, something that China wholeheartedly supports, it held up agreements for six years um, in order to have this principle that nobody could interfere in its internal affairs. Nobody could tell it whether it was doing a good job or not. Um, and that, but when that principle was finally conceded, that's when it agreed to uh, the, 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 the Paris Climate Accord. And so I think China has this model of international relations, which is very atomistic. It's just a series of units, individual sovereign states that sort of relate to one another like kind of billiard balls bouncing off one another. Um, they don't see a world of alliances and coalitions and small states, medium states banding together to, to support their own interests. They see it very much as kind of uh, 
individual states, big and small, which obviously allow bigger states to push smaller states around. Great, okay, well, um, we've got a couple of questions uh, here about Taiwan. Um, one from Zara Kempton and one from Andrew Farron, both of whom I think were, Zara is now the, uh, the vice president of, uh, of the national body of this institute. But I think both at one stage were, uh, were presidents of our, of AIA Victoria. So there's obviously something in the water down there about Taiwan. Um, but Taiwan has quite a special place in the story. Of course, the, the, I mean, I guess you can say that the direct inheritor is at least the KMT is the direct inheritor of the, the Republic of China. Um, and um, I'm, I actually remember going to Taiwan on a study tour and we were kind of introduced to some KMT grandee. I, didn't, I can't remember who it was now. And um, they gave us a lecture on, on you know, what, what the fundamental beliefs of the KMT were. And of course they claimed all of China, but the, the guy who was talking to us said, but our claim is superior to that of the communist party because we claim Mongolia as well. <laughs> um, but, but then we went to um, the offices of the DPP and we didn't really talk about nationalism issues so much, but there were pictures around the place of, um, of, of you know, the, the, the Taiwanese hero Ko Shing Ah and the, the Dutch, um, the Dutch colonization of Taiwan. And it seems to me that um, this might be one of the points of sensitivity that China has towards Taiwan is that Taiwan, um, because of its democratic narrative or de democratic uh, uh, construction is capable of articulating narratives um, of forms of localized nationalism, particularly in the DPP and other places. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a fascinating laboratory at the moment to kind of see how nationalist ideas are taken apart and, and, and then and, and rebuilt. I mean, it's quite easy to kind of construct a, a national narrative for Taiwan based on the kind of things you're talking about, you know, the uh, the pirate or was he the hero, you know, Kushinga, uh, the fact that it was sort of independently run, of course, it was then uh, you know, under Japanese control from 1895 to 1945, um, all of these things. Um, and obviously the DPP, you know, being independence minded leans in that direction. Um, and you get the KMT or, or even more sort of determinedly what was called the new party who can absolutely insist on um, uh, the fact that Taiwan is in rightfully part of, uh, of the mainland. And this is obviously tied up with demographics and you know, the, the people who came with uh, Chiang Kai-shek in 1949 to retreat onto the island, um, you know, brought these ideas with them. Uh, they dominated politics for you know, a generation and then they kind of, they're old and they've passed on and a new generation has come through. It's in, I mean, in the book and in this chapter, I tell a story about how uh, 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 Zhang Qiyun, the guy who writes the textbooks, is the guy that actually um, advises Chiang Kai-shek that uh, Taiwan is the place to um, retreat to. So his role is actually, you know, pretty critical in this. And so in Taiwan, as an idea, it becomes very important. I would argue that Taiwan psychologically only becomes part of China in 1942. Um, what I mean by that is that there were, there were for a while, exiles, people who objected to the Japanese occupation, kind of milling around, but they didn't really have any, you know, force um, until after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, during the Second World War. Uh, and at that point, Chiang Kai-shek and others began to think, hang on, if the Americans are going to enter this war, then Japan's probably going to lose. So let's start thinking about what we can get back. And at that point, Taiwan becomes, you know, achievable. Um, and the whole previous decades of uh, forgetting about Taiwan is put aside and, uh, and Taiwan enters uh, Chinese nationalist thinking in, in 1942. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, um, uh, you, know, it's a, you know, Taiwan obviously it represents that continuity now. And of course, the, 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 you know, when, it, when you think about the South China Sea, uh, for example, um, you know, the, the claims to those various rocks and reefs were developed by the Republic of China, and sort of, and so the the ROC Taiwan is the is the kind of the the holder, if you like, of that claim. Um, so it's a kind of you know it's one of the sort of reasons, I guess, why 
um, uh, you know, people put, you know, by, by the PRC put so much store on, on succeeding, uh, replacing the, the Republic of China, that it therefore inherits everything that was done by the Republic of China in those um, 40 years or so between the revolution, between the two revolutions. Great. Um, I'll just carry on quickly with um, Andrew Farron's question because there were two parts to his question. And I know that you covered this extensively in the book, um, but he asks, did the Chinese um, have a time back then, I suppose, um, on back, back when the, the, the nation state was being formed, uh, on, uh, did they have a position on the overseas Chinese, particularly in Southeast Asia? Were they considered Chinese and with what implications? And um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, how China views its overseas Chinese uh, today, because you do cover that quite a bit in the book. Yeah, I mean, I write about this in the context of um, uh, debates about race uh, and identity and, and how those were affected by uh, European thinking about race uh, at the time. And the surprising fact is that, um, you know, a lot of the unpleasant racial thinking of Europeans, uh, people like Herbert Spencer and others, um, in terms of a hierarchy of races and, 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 and skin color and, and its importance, were surprisingly adopted wholeheartedly by uh, Chinese thinkers, you know, and on the grounds that basically, okay, if the whites are the, the highest, you know, race, then the yellows are second. And if we can come, you know, kind of keep, keep working at it, kind of, we can get to number one. It was the kind of sort of thinking. Um, uh, and so they kind of bought into a lot of, of, of racial thinking. And this colors um, a lot of attitudes towards, um, towards overseas Chinese. I mean, you have to remember that you know, for a long time, even to leave the country was uh, illegal. Um, so a lot of people who were living in Southeast Asia in particular, um, but also Australia, North America, um, you know, they were, they were criminals because they, they, they left the country without permission. Um, but two things start to happen. You get to the, you know, the, the spread of reformist and then later revolutionary thinking among these people, they become seen as a sort of um, a valuable resource uh, for, for back home. Um, and then there are stories of all of their mistreatment and a sense that some that China should do something on behalf of these people. Um, uh, and you get this the emergence of this word Hua Chao, and Hua is the sort of sense of being Chinese and civilized and cultured, and Chao is kind of working you know, as a temporary worker abroad. And the idea is that the Hua Chao is only abroad temporarily because of hardship and that one day that they will return. And these ideas about whether these people you know, belong to China or not kind of go backwards and forwards. Um, but they're, you know, because they're wealthy and they have an international network, they become the bedrock of the, the nationalist movement and then the, the revolutionary movement. In fact, I would argue that the very image we have of China today is one that is constructed outside China by these, uh, these groups, these exiles, they're in Japan or they're in Southeast Asia or Australia or North America, and they're looking back at their country and they're seeing it in its international context. And they imbibe the ideas of, of nation uh, from where they're living and they project it back on their homeland and their ideas are then uh, internalized back in China. And they become the ideas of, of the revolution. Um, so I think, um, I mean, you know, Chinese communities, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, suffered a lot because of this sense that they were had dual loyalties, that they were loyal mainly to their ancestral home back in China and, and not so much to the way they were living. But this was partly because uh, governments in, and particularly colonial governments in Southeast Asia, didn't give Chinese um, uh, uh, individuals uh, local citizenship you know they kind of treated them separately and this kind of got taken on board by the post-colonial states I mean I'm, I'm generalizing but that happened in many cases um, and then they went through a long period of sort of struggle and they were accepted and they've given local citizenship and all the rest of it um, but now I think there is an attempt by Beijing to reach out to some of these communities and try to tell them that they owe loyalty to the motherland and that therefore they should act in the interest of the motherland. And I think this is very worrying and dangerous. Um, it starts to undermine the position of communities in Southeast Asia and other countries. I mean, we saw in a case of the Chinese ambassador to Malaysia 
before an election going down and basically standing in the middle of Chinatown and saying, we are here to defend the interests of the Chinese community and you know, um, uh, we, will, we will stand up for them when that caused a huge negative reaction um, uh, and, and greater problems. So I think there, has been, there have been some clumsy attempts by the PRC to try to um, recruit overseas Chinese uh, as, um, as a sort of, um, as allies. Um, and I think it's worrying. Um, and I think it's one that in most cases, people who are settled in other countries uh, aren't very happy about, but obviously there are other issues. And I know this is obviously a very live and sensitive issue in, in, uh, in Australia at the time, at the, at the current time. Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, there's a question related to this um, from Aston Kwok, and it's about um, it's about nationalism in the region in general. And uh, I mean, you're you're an expert on many countries in the region, and particularly Southeast Asia. So he asks, do you see similar kinds of national anxiety uh, in other parts of Asia, for example, Vietnam? Um, and he's asking also what this does for resolution, I mean, what, what this might mean for the resolution of disputes over the South China Sea. Are disputes over the South China Sea primarily a matter of nationalism, um, or is it a resource grab? Um, if it is nationalism, then is there any hope for uh, resolution whatsoever? Good question. Um, I have an article which I haven't got around to finishing yet, um, called The Importance of Humiliation. And, and comparing China's experience of the South China Sea uh, with Vietnam's. Um, and the difference is that the sense of humiliation in China occurs much earlier. Uh, it occurs in 1909 in connection with Japan, Japan grabbing um, uh, some islands, and then in 1933, an argument with the French. Um, uh, and so these, and those crises are deliberately kind of used by the government and by nationalists to kind of mobilize anxiety. There's no similar anxiety in Vietnam about islands until 1974. And that's partly because it was the colonial French government that was pushing the claim. Um, and so it didn't really kind of curry any support from the, from, the, from the local population, from the Vietnamese population. But in 1974, there's a battle over the Paracels and China uh, pushes Vietnam out of the uh, half the islands. And suddenly it, you see the same kind of things happening in Vietnam as you saw in China in 1933. The sense of humiliation and loss galvanizes public opinion and it becomes a cause celeb. Before 1974, I don't think anybody in Vietnam really cared about the islands in the South China Sea. Um, but after 1974, it becomes a marker of belonging. That to be Vietnamese, you have to care passionately about the South China Sea. Um, I don't think there have been similar incidents in other countries so far. I mean, a little bit in the Philippines. I mean, you get um, people marching in the streets, but relatively small numbers. Doesn't seem to have happened in Malaysia, uh, certainly not in Brunei or Indonesia. Um, so this experience of humiliation, I think, is really important for constructing national identity. And I think it's the reason why uh, the, the disputes are so hard to resolve in the South China Sea there. I mean, I think that China places um, uh, huge importance on the idea of, of territorial uh, you know, reacquisition, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, as Xi Jinping puts it. Um, and so, Yes, there are material reasons for wanting to hang on to bits of the South China Sea, you know, the rights to the fish and the oil and that kind of thing. But the reason why the states can't compromise, and then there's an obvious solution to the South China Sea, which is simply that everybody keeps what they currently occupy, and then they just recognize international law, the law of the sea, to divide up the resources in the waters around them. I mean, it's, it's blindingly obvious. Um, but no state is willing to kind of stand up and say this because they fear they will, you know, risk the wrath of their population. And, and this, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a useful, you know, emotion for governments to 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 use from time to time to demonstrate their patriotism and, and their fitness to rule. And so, even for example, you know, Vietnam and Philippines, you know, two countries who are not going to go to war with one another. Um, you know, and who are facing problems from China, which they share, are not willing to kind of reach a compromise with each other about um, 
you know, who owns which, you know, which rock and reef, um, because they fear their, their domestic constituencies. So I don't think it's the reason for the disputes, but I think it's the reason why the disputes can't be solved uh, in the logical and simple way that I have decided. If, if things could happen the way that we could decide. I mean. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let me be a bit provocative then on this point, because um, well, about a decade ago, I think um, Henry Kissinger was talking about the notion of a, of a G2, a kind of um, an idea where the United States and, uh, and uh, China would work together to manage the global commons, and the United States would give perhaps China a bit of breathing room around the South China Sea. And other scholars have said similar things. Here in Australia, we have uh, Hugh White and uh, Brendan Taylor, who, um, who in their books have, have sort of suggested perhaps the United States should stand back a little bit. Um, it's more based on Hugh and, Hugh and Brendan's argument is more based on a on a on a simple calculation of power politics and in Hugh's mind that that uh, that the United States can no longer exert the power that it needs to in order to give, uh, for example, the claimant states states in the South China Sea options. If I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate and read your book, book provocatively, I might say, well. Wouldn't that be um, a, a fairly good solution? Because if we're, we're reading, um, if, if, we, if we accept the notion that what China wants really is to reclaim all of these lands or oceans, whether, um, whether, whether they're constructed in the modern era or not, um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't doing what Hugh and Brendan and, and perhaps Kissinger say, um, uh basically solve the problem because China wouldn't want any more its nationalist needs would have been satisfied if you like I wonder um, if you have a view on that yeah um okay I mean I think that it was well the, the, so the good news about Chinese nationalism is that it, it does seem to have a line around it, it it's you know, it's not sort of like you know Germany in the 1930s where you think well you know, give them this and they'll kind of keep on, you know, demanding a bit more. So uh, you know, China has, you know, I guess fairly remarkably settled almost all of its land borders with the, uh, except with the exceptions of the two bits in, uh, in the Himalayas. Um, and the problem is on the, on the maritime frontiers. But um, I mean, although you do get voices saying, you know, you know, Vladivostok used to be Chinese or whatever. I mean, they, they don't seem to be part of, 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 of state uh, ideology even though these maps of national humiliation still, still circulate. Um, so, I mean, there is a definitely a line around um, China's ambitions, um, but what it, this idea that somehow there's this G2 idea, it, it's, you know, you could call it an Asian Yalta, that somehow that, you know, the, it's up, up to the, the big powers to, to carve up the region and, and decide who's going to sit on, on which side of the line. Um, and certainly, uh, countries like Vietnam and most of the rest of Southeast Asia have no desire to be put into some kind of um, Chinese sphere of influence where they're just expected to kind of um, respond to, to Beijing's uh, interests. Um, I mean, I kind of think the, uh, the real China choice is uh, and I, <laughs> neighbor or a-hole. You know, what, what's China gonna be, you know, to, it, to its friends? I mean, it has, you know, it, that's the real China choice and it's up to China. Um, uh, I mean, to decide whether it's going to be a, a good citizen um, in, in the region. And this is the sort of the odd thing I, I, I found about China's behavior is it's, it's so counterproductive. You know, if you go back to 2009, everything was going their way. Uh, the financial crisis in the West, um, they'd settled their border disputes, they were rising, everybody loved them in the region. And then they go and stick the map of the South China Sea claim into the UN and suddenly Southeast Asia starts thinking, hang on, they're serious about all this nonsense. And then they, that sort of gives an opening to the US and then, then everything uh, returns, you know, everything sort of comes back in, in a sort of an American direction and we get this kind of power competition. So, I mean, the problem, of course, we're just saying like, there's an international dateline and China, you know, runs everything on that side of it and America runs everything on the other side of it, um, is that you end up with this sort of smothering, uh, behavior by uh, you know, a state in which you know, everyone's supposed to kind of kowtow to uh, the big power. I mean, that's not really what 
people in Southeast Asia want. I don't think it's up for up to the United States and Beijing. It's eight hours. You know whether um, you know Vietnam should you know buy you know Chinese products and you know conform its internet rules to uh, ones that China finds acceptable or whatever. Um, I mean, if you believe in uh, government's sovereignty, then you should believe in in their in, in their ability to 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 choose between different options. Um, so yeah, you can I can see the kind of you know the Kissinger esque you know convenience of this. Um, but um, you know I read I read Hugh White's China Choice and I spent and I'm the whole time looking for facts. There are no facts in China Choice. It's a whole series of assertions. Um, and you know I was looking for some empirics to agree or disagree with. Um, but the you know when you actually look at the facts and you look at what people in Vietnam and Singapore and Malaysia actually want, they don't want a G two. Okay, great answer. Now, um, as I said, I did teach uh, the theory of nationalism at one stage, and there is an asshole theory of nationalism. So uh, it's free online if you want to look it up. Um, I'll let you discover who the author thinks the asshole is. Um, in the meantime, though, I want to um, genuinely plug these books again because they are fantastic. Uh, the latest is The Invention of China. Um, Please do read this book, The South China Sea. It's a great book. Is this worth 10% now, Phil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, back, back 15%, I think. And, <laughs> and, and my current weekend reading is Vietnam Rising Dragon, um, latest edition in 2020. Um, I want to thank you all for hanging on. We, are, we have gone a minute or so over time. Um, and um, thank you, Bill. Uh, I hope to meet you in person one of these days. I'm getting sick of saying that, but, uh, but it's true nonetheless. And, um, and stick around uh, to see what is coming up. And we'll oh, thank you also to Phoebe, our communications assistant, who is now going to take us out. Mm -hmm.